Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Syracuse Sports. We got the whole band here today to talk some Syracuse spring football. Brent Axe, Emily Liker, and Chris Carlson, ladies and gentlemen. We will be at the spring football game on Saturday. Complete coverage coming your way on Syracuse.com. Emily and I are going to do a live post game pod after the spring game as well. A lot happening up until then. This crew has been covering spring football throughout. We're going to have some fun and give you some spring football superlatives coming up. We're going to hear from QB1, Kyle McCord, and offensive line coach Dale Williams, and much more as we go through here today. Let me turn it over to Chris and Emily to start off with today. It's our last look at practice. They are going to have a walkthrough on Friday, though the media will not be allowed at this walkthrough, and then we'll all see what's going to happen on Saturday at the spring game. Uh, Chris, let me uh, turn to you first. What were some things that stood out to you today uh, from practice? Well, uh, you guys both pointed it out, um, but I mean, you know, the, the biggest change or the biggest interesting, the most interesting thing was Braden Davis getting some reps at wide receiver. Um, you know, well, it's one of the two guys that was competing for a backup quarterback. Uh, usually you uh, do not take reps at wide receiver unless you were exiting the, uh, the backup quarterback competition or, or at least seriously considering a, a position change. So um, I think it tells us probably who's winning the backup com- competition. Um, and, you know, it's Carlos Del Rio Wilson, Wilson for the moment. Emily, we saw Braden Davis get in that wildcat formation a little bit. They didn't really trust him to throw the football at the end of last year. Could be just a little bit more of that when we came back to – go to interviews and we saw a little bit more of practice when they were at the end of practice. Davis was back with the quarterbacks. So it's not like they completely put him out at receiver, but still something uh, worth keeping an eye on for sure. Yeah. He had his, he still had his black, no contact Jersey on. Um, We saw the quarterback group, the three of them doing up downs after practice. So presumably something might've not gone the way they wanted to at the back (laughs) half of practice. We don't want, and if they were getting punished like that, um, as for, I think, something interesting that stood out to me about today's practice was they did some conditioning, which we haven't seen all, all year so far. I don't know if that – we couldn't really tell if that was like a punishment for something that had happened in a little bit of a team period that we saw or if that was just something they'd kind of been working in. Obviously, conditioning will be like a big part of the summer routine, so I don't know if maybe this is just them slowly starting to transition into that. But so I saw them do some wind sprints both – while we were actually at practice, and then I caught a glimpse of them doing them again when we came back and we're waiting in the hallway for interviews. So that was something that we haven't seen so far, and I'm curious kind of what that was about, if it was, hey, we need to get you guys in line before the spring game, or just, hey, we just want to get you more conditioned. Speaking of uh, conditioning, yeah, Fran Brown, look, we've seen it. He's always intense at practice. But he was really ticked off today. And we saw that conditioning that you mentioned, Emily. So then when they kind of broke off, the defense was outside. The offense moved inside. We went in with the offense. Fran was in it with the offensive line, running them hard, saying, run it again, run it again, run it again, saying a lot of words. I can't even repeat it here on a podcast. I do have some video up on uh, my Twitter feed at Brent Dax Media if you want to see it. It reminded me of the scene from Miracle when Herb Brooks was – running the team, skating the team, if you will, after he was not happy with how they behaved at an exhibition game, and he just kept saying, again, again, again. So between what we saw and what you mentioned, Emily, and what Fran was not thinking, he kept saying, "Get you need to be tougher. He's He was really in with the offensive line today. We asked Dale Williams about that a little bit, too, and he kind of smiled and said, you know, that's Fran getting in there and, and working with our offensive line. So – The intensity right to the end here. He wants this to be uh, shaped up and edged out. And we've all asked about it, guys. Like, at the end of the day, it's the offensive line that has been the problem at Syracuse that has had the most issues with depth at Syracuse in recent years. And when you have a pro-style quarterback who's not quite as mobile as some other quarterbacks we've seen in the past, I mean, no matter what we talk about here, and I'll turn it uh, over to you guys just for observation on this, It's all going to come down to the offensive line. And credit to Dale Williams. I'm going to play the clip. Thank you, Chris, for asking the question. He actually told us what his working first-team offensive line is right now, which we've kind of uh, been talking about here on the pod anyway. But uh, shout-out to him for telling us uh, basically what his first team is at this point. 
Well, we're all going to see it Saturday. So, I mean, you know, no, 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 no point keeping the secret uh, at, at this point. Um, uh, you know, and speaking about the toughness, like, you know, Fran had a similar approach with some of the wide receivers and the defensive backs when we first got there. They were running, a, you know, uh, three defensive backs and, and two wide receivers blocking in front and a running back. And, you know, same type of thing. He was just having them sort of go over and over again if he wasn't happy with the, the quality of the blocking or, or how the defensive players were, were taking on the block. Um, and we have heard all, all, all spring, you know, toughness and in, increasing the team's toughness has been, you know, a focus. Um, where under Dino Babers, you know, it, it was more like player preservation, I think, mm-hmm. at this point. You know, the, the idea that we would see full contact hitting over and over and over again in, in certain drills, uh, you know, m- maybe I have a selective memory, but I don't remember seeing it. I want to play that clip I mentioned. Uh, we had an opportunity to talk with Dale Williams today for the first time, the offensive line coach, and he, and he mentioned uh, the ultimate motivator. In football, You're oh, that, that's that's uh, the the five out there would be uh, uh, Witherspoon and uh, Petrie, Reed, Bradford, and uh, right now um, Cruz and, and Josh Miller. Uh, so though Josh Miller and Enrique are bad on each day, uh, but there's competition. I mean, uh, they all know, you know, I could just pull you out any second because I think get better. You need competition, and with that being said, um, I have to create it. So how do I create it? Hey. You, you screw up, I'm going to pull you out. I'm, you know, I'm not going to let you sit in there and go, oh, you're going to repeal, you're going to screw up, and you're going to say it's okay. I mean, life doesn't work that way. You screw up something at work, uh, the guy that you work for gets on you, and that's what I'm trying to teach the kids. Hey, it's not okay to consistently screw up and be rewarded. All right? You know, the greatest motivator is your ass is on the bench. You know, then the bench transmit, transmits a signal to your ass, which transmits a signal to your brain. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it's a great process because then you play better. So I think the bench is a great motivator. Dale Williams has been one of the more intense coaches we've seen at spring practice for sure. And I, I like that, uh, that clip that kind of fits in with what a football coach would say about that kind of thing. And, and Emily, we've kind of tracked what we've seen as the first team offensive line. Chris made a great point, like the spring game Saturday, might as well not hide it. Well, I've seen football coaches that hide it and, and you know, they're, they're weird creatures. So a shout out to Dale for doing that, but he did throw in the name Josh Miller there, Emily. And that's the guy I've been curious about how much he's going to push to get on the field. It feels like he's right on the cusp of doing that. Right. And I mean, I had him at, at second string behind Cruz on, on the depth chart on Monday. And so certainly that could be a little bit of a battle there into the fall. And again, like, These are set in stone for the spring game, and then they're going to get chiseled and reworked and completely redone again, probably by fall. And sure, there are going to be names that carry over, but there are also going to be names that, you know, summer conditioning does good things for them. Fall camp does good things for them. And and Josh Miller certainly seems poised that he could be one of those guys. We, uh, we, right. uh, I mean, David Wollabaugh is coming back to your point, Emily, we don't know where he's going to fit in. Um, Mm -hmm. Syracuse, um, has been linked to uh, offensive tackle from Colorado, who was a starter right. in Colorado with the transfer portal. Who's uh, visiting this in, weekend. Good point, Chris. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, maybe another tackle added into the mix where, where there's already three that they're talking about competing. So, uh, you know, they're, they're serious about creating competition at those spots. There's going to be a lot of visitors at the spring game, uh, more recruits coming in, more alums expected than ever. Uh, Zaire Franklin and John Lally will, will be uh, uh, alumni coaches. And there is a transfer coming in who is a Rochester native at wide receiver who's got a couple years of eligibility left amongst, uh, you talked about the Colorado offensive tackle coming in, Colorado State transfer wide receiver Justice Ross Simmons, who last year had 45 catches, 724 yards, three touchdowns, as noted, a Rochester native, uh, noted as one of the better wide receivers in the portal. He will be visiting uh, this weekend at Syracuse as well. So uh, the constant stream of visitors coming in, which is also something we got a chance to talk about, guys. I don't have any sound from this, so I'll just kind of ask you what stood out in this. We talked to GM Nate McNeil. We talked to his recruiting staff, and we also, uh, it, it, which included, by the way, and Chris and I got a kick out of this having covered Paul Pascaloni, Cammy Pascaloni, Paul's daughter, who is now – on the recruiting staff, and to just see that come full circle, uh, first of all, the gray patch in my hair got a little bit grayer seeing that. But, Chris, Paul was like the all-time old-school coach, right? And to hear Cammy Pasqualoni talking about how they do things for social media, how they do things for recruits, kind of modernizing 
the way football is. I just, I found that contrast so fascinating because her dad could not be more of a representation of, you know, old school guy, glasses on the end of his nose like this, you know, in the film room, just old school football, George DeLeon, old school football. And now she's on the cusp of, of doing things in, in a new and, and fresh way as you have to in recruiting these days. Yeah, I had the same reaction when she was talking about the hibachis going viral on Barstool Sports. <laughs> and I'm like, what would Paul think if he heard all those words strung together? <laughs> like, like what, what would his reaction to all of that be? Emily, anything stand out to you? We were kind of sitting there like, what does a GM do? Like, that's kind of a relatively new thing in football. And I think Nate explained it pretty well. Yeah, you know, it, it's definitely very much a, a roster management uh, role. And that's not unlike what a GM's role is at the professional level, right? I think the key difference is at the collegiate level, he is under Fran, whereas at the professional level, usually the GM is above the head coach. And so that's kind of a little flip-flop dynamic there. Um, but yeah, it, it's all roster management stuff. It's transfer portal, it's recruiting. And so basically, um, I'm going to write about this a little bit more in tomorrow's kind of final what we learned notebook, but he just kind of streamlines all of that for, for Fran and kind of hands him like, Hey, you said you need an offensive tackle. These are the five guys I think that we should go after in the portal and, and does it that way for him. And Fran had a really good quote about it on, on Tuesday when we talked to him, kind of just talking about the importance of having someone in that role who does not have the type of relationships he does with the players and can kind of keep those things separate. Cause like Fran's like, I'm on the field coaching them every single day. Like I get to know their families in a way that Nate doesn't, I get to know everything about them in a way that Nate doesn't. And so by, by having that separate, you kind of have that, that neutral guy who can be like, look, I don't think this player is serving our team anymore. I think this guy in the transfer portal is going to be better than the recruit that you've had a relationship with for three years, whatever it may be. And so that was certainly really interesting. You know, it's a new position that we're seeing kind of emerge in, in college football. And now Syracuse is on the forefront of that, but yeah, it'll be interesting. The one thing that I, I did think was, I don't know what the adjective I want to use is, but we asked him, we asked him if he, is involved with the NIL stuff in any way, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. when you think roster management and you think GM, you think, how are they involved in the money side of things? And he said he has no role in that. He shouted out the collectives. He's like, we have great collectives here, but I don't have a role in that. So then it's kind of like, okay, well, who does, who does have the role? Maybe yeah. it's just the agents of these players, but you'd have to think somewhere on the staff, there's someone who facilitates that as much as they're allowed to um and so it was interesting to hear him say that it honestly it, it Emily, isn't him i think it's fran i think fran is is pushing the buttons on a lot of that organizing a lot of that and doing the, the best he can as a coach to kind of direct that and you know the rules on this are still like how does that work and who does what and i think a lot of guys are afraid to say something like the recruiting staff for example they cannot talk about specific recruits and they kind of had to dance around that but one thing that has stood out there is they have just flooded practices with recruits, particularly the Saturday scrimmages and the Saturday practices through spring ball. And they're just exposing Syracuse football, not only on social media, but in person to as many recruits as they can and recruits talk and recruits post things on social media. And sometimes they're the best recruiters. So it was interesting to get their perspective on things. And I was talking to one gentleman afterwards, I forget his name. We're learning all these these names of the new staffers. And he just kind of smiled. And he's like, man, Fran is exactly the same. I've known him since he was 18 years old. And the, the recruiting staff said their office is right next to Fran's. And a couple of, of the, the recruiting staffers said how much Fran is knee deep in it, how many prospects a day he watches and how involved in film he is. Some coaches just leave that to the recruiting staff, and then they come in and kind of close the deal. But Fran sounds like he is knee-deep in this thing and is, is heavily involved in the process. Uh, before we do our spring practice superlatives, guys, we heard from QB1 today. We heard from Kyle McCord at the beginning of practice, and we heard again from Kyle McCord here at the end of spring practice. So let's listen into a couple things that he had to say today. Here's QB1. Coach Fran, coming from a similar program like Georgia, he's brought that same kind of mindset, the same pedigree over here. And um, I was talking to some of the guys. Usually when a new head coach comes in, the older players leave. You know, the guys that play go to a different school. And, you know, they bring in a lot of younger guys. But this team, you look around, there's a lot of guys that have experience, a lot of guys who have won games. And so I think that, 
you know, that, that level of play, that standard is still that high. And obviously, like I said, Coach Rand coming in has enforced that. There's Kyle McCord discussing. He was asked a question about coming from a national championship caliber program at Ohio State, trying to set that standard here at Syracuse as well. And as he noted there, uh, so did Fran Brown coming from Georgia. Uh, a couple more from Kyle McCord. Let's listen into this one. These are some players he said have, have stood out to him on the offensive side of the Zed. Yeah. Zed has been really good. Treb's been really good. Uh, he's been a veteran guy who surprised me. I mean, he knows a lot of football. He understands leverages and stuff like that. And then Dan Villar has really come around too. I think this is uh, his first real offseason as a tight end. Um, so just to see uh, his growth from practice one to now has been great. Emily, we've heard that name time and again here. I don't know if this will come up in our superlatives here shortly, but Zed Haynes is just – from people that have been at scrimmages, the players we've talked to on both sides of the ball, when that question is asked, I feel like that's a name that has rolled right off the tongue in uh, Zeed Haynes, the Georgia wide receiver transfer. Oh, yeah. I mean, he certainly popped and caught a lot of eyes, both on the team, both in the media. And then, I mean, social media, you see people shout him out all the time and be like, wow, that guy's so fast. His speed is something that we've heard a lot about. So, yeah, he's top up there. I was going to say the Dan Villari shout out. I saw quite a bit of him today and he he was making some great catches downfield today so definitely Dan Valeri pass catcher we will be seeing again this fall and here's one more from uh, Kyle I think overall the team the toughness um I think the level of intensity of practice has raised a lot which has been good uh really good competition offense and defense and that's say for the offense uh just getting the timing down the communication I think was a big piece of it um and I think right now we're getting to a point where we're rolling and, and things are going pretty smooth but obviously it's still a lot of room for improvement. All right, guys. I thought we uh, and Emily had a great idea here to kind of wrap up spring practice and the things that we've seen at spring practice over the past few weeks with some spring football superlatives. All right. So we have three categories, and it is going to start with media MVP. And it could be a player, it could be a coach, it could be anybody we've talked to. We've talked to more people at this spring practice than we have uh, anybody because the assistant coaches had uh, the, the, the blackout lifted and could speak to the media here. So we got a lot of good candidates here. So, Emily, I'll start with you, then we'll go to Chris, and then I'll give you mine. Who's your media MVP? You know, like you said, there are, there are a lot of guys to choose from, both on the player side and the coach side debated doing an assistant coach because we had certainly had some good stories from them debated going back to old reliable Dan Valari, who gave us some good stuff uh, as ever this spring. But I think someone who stood out to me and who I had a couple, I had one good one-on-one -on -one conversation with, and I know one of you guys talked to him as well was Dennis Jockes Jr. Um, I am riding with him on the bring Wawa to Syracuse <laughs> train and he was just, he was super fun this spring and, and you you can really see that he's kind of like grown into just the role of an older guy. I, I don't want to call him a veteran yet because he hasn't played as much and he's, he still is on the younger side a little bit on this team, but you can, you can see how much he's grown up in entering his, I believe, third season here. And so he was a good guy to chat with this spring. Chris, how about you? I, so I agree with uh, Emily. I, Dennis had, was, was a very enjoyable conversation. Um, talked a little bit about Fran getting on the microphone and just talking trash, you know, to players and, and saying, like, if you can't hold your composure when I'm yelling at you, like, you're not going to in a game. And, you know, we're, we're trying to reduce penalties. Uh, I'm giving Fran the overall MVP just for, uh, you know, lifting the uh, iron curtain on assistant <laughs> coach interviews because, uh, you know, Ross Douglas was a lot of fun. James Volano was a lot of fun. Um, and we wouldn't have had that opportunity if uh, we didn't have a head coach who let us talk to assistant coaches. There were a lot of good choices. You guys mentioned a couple of great names there. Ross Douglas, very close silver medal here. I really enjoyed what he had to say and the energy he brought to the conversation and the stories he had, not only about Fran, but about his time in New England with Bill Belichick. But I'm going to go with uh, Jackson Meeks, the Georgia wide receiver transfer, who I talked to a few different times individually, and he was – at the the group podium if you will and there was there was one exchange here that kind of encapsulates jackson meeks and and the insight that he brought i'll play for you, you. believe me if i say it was harder up here <laughs> no but <laughs> you said <you're> saying it. <laughs> man coach smith coach jb coach nick coach stacks they're doing a great job up here man like i was in the georgia conditioning program for three years and when i came up here i was you know i of course i had the thoughts that okay it's not going to be Georgia. It's not going to be that hard. But 
I got smacked in the face first workout. <laughs> first workout, I was, I was breathing hard. I was sweating. I'm like, dang, like, okay. I see how we come. We really trying to, you know, really trying to hold the standard and, you know, get better. So, you know, they're bringing a great culture up here. And, you know, everything starts in the weight room. So that's how you prevent injuries. That's how you prevent, you know, bad stuff from happening on the field with your muscles and with your bones. You know, just everything is getting stronger. So they're doing a great job in helping us get stronger and helping us cut fat. We heard from so many guys that said how much harder those workouts were in the offseason leading into spring practice, and I think uh, Jackson put it as, as well as you could there. Would you believe me if I said it was harder here than at Georgia? Spring standout. A couple of good candidates here, Emily. Who would you ultimately settle on? Oh, it's tough. I think it, yeah. You know, especially with so many new faces, right? We were mm-hmm. really focusing – and when you're really focusing on certain guys, they just automatically stick out in your mind more. The one I keep coming back to is Marcellus Barnes. And I, I'm i so curious. I put him as the first string CB with Devin Grant behind him. We talked about on Tuesday that like I, I do think that's still a battle. And so I'm, I'm curious to see if he, one, does end up being the number one cornerback out there on, on Saturday in the spring game. But then, two, if he can – stay in this conversation and and maybe permanently win that job by week one in the fall. Um, Yeah. He's just, he's just impressed. We saw, we have like physically seen the progression of how he's gotten better. We talked early on in in the spring about there had been a team period we saw where he almost had an interception and couldn't quite get his hands on it. And like, we've just seen him grow from there. And so I think, that would have to be my guy. You know, it's always impressive to have a true freshman stand out like that. And, and he has certainly been the one in that group of early enrollees to, to do that. Chris, who's your spring standout? So I'm going to go easy answer, which means you guys are so much smarter than me. Like, like, <laughs> like, I watch the quarterbacks, <laughs> like Kyle McCord is so much better than the other two. Like, like, like there's just such a, a huge difference. And I'm not a great judge of talent. Like if I saw any of these guys throwing on their own, I'm sure I thought they're, they were, all, they'd all be great but like when you watch Kyle run the same drills as the other guys like they are worlds apart um, and that concerns me in some ways because like Kyle mm-hmm. has to stay healthy but like you know he, he is a, he's a vast upgrade from the backups and, and he's hugely important and you know he can really throw it. Kyle McCord's a great choice we heard Zed Haynes we heard Jackson Meeks Marcellus Barnes is, is right up there I think that's a name we heard a lot particularly when you have new guys around, right, that, that are standing out and the level of talent that they're bringing in, right? My choice is Fidel Diggs, though. You watch that defensive line, and there's just a body, and, a, and a, that, that, that number 10, you're just like, man, that just looks like a dude. And from we didn't get to see a lot of team periods, or we weren't at the scrimmages, but I talked to a bunch of people that were, and – one per I'm, I'm like I said, you're, you realize you're invoking royalty here, but he said, I understand that. But he said he looks like Freeney with the way he gets off the edge, the moves that he has, how polished he is. You're going to drop that, and that's a, a source that I would trust that wouldn't misuse that. That, And that's what they need. They need a standout. There's a lot of new faces on the defensive line. Elijah Robinson changing the defense around a little bit here. So he is almost the level on defense, Chris, to what you compare with Kyle McCord. Not that there's not talented players on that defense. You've got a Marlo Wax and a Justin Barron and some guys that almost went to the NFL draft last year. But Diggs, you're just going to see, is a huge, huge difference maker up front. Most exciting addition. Emily, I will turn to you for this one. Mm-hmm. Mine is Hill, but now... Now, I don't want to go, I don't want to double down, but I guess I will. I mean, like, Kyle was obviously the, the biggest talk of the offseason, but Fidel was right there behind him, and I, he could have been the guy we talk about in any of these categories. He was also great at the podium. He was one of those guys that did not have 11 a.m. class, so he got thrown up there <laughs> quite a few times to talk with us and always had a smile on his face, always willing to talk to us and, and share some things. And, you know, I think for this this D line, he's just going to be so valuable in teaching the younger guys and getting them prepared for when he, like he only has one year here. He's not going to be here in multiple years. And so 
I think the fact that he comes with Elijah Robinson and, and they know each other so well, and he also kind of has a relationship with Nick Williams, like he's kind of like a third coach in that room. And, and like, you just can't ask for something better in a position group like the D line where games are often decided. We talk about games being decided in the trenches all the time. And, and Syracuse's D line this year, I think is just in a, in a great position to show that with Fidel. How about you, Chris? Well, I'm just, in an effort to avoid like repeating, you know, some of the same names. Like, I'll, I'll go Demetrius Weatherspoon, um, just because I think he's like important. You know, like, like mm-hmm. we've talked about the importance of of keeping Kyle McCord upright, um, keeping him healthy. Um, you know, and I don't know if it'll be the starting offensive tackle by the time uh, he gets around, uh, by the time the season gets around, because they're gonna have so much competition there. But like, you know, that's a spot where they need to get better at, and and it's it's critical for the team. As much as uh, Emily knows, my fascination with young Yassine Willis, the freshman running back mm-hmm. who, That's a good one. to invoke Springsteen, who was in town, he's a wrecking ball out there. He, he's just, he sta- I mean, LaQuinn Allen is clearly the first team running back. He's getting out there. He's not going to supplant him anytime soon. But Willis is going to play, and I'm really excited to see that combination and how much these coaches have talked about wanting to run the football be physical what does coach brown say all the time like big people beat up little people that's a big person that's going to do that however i am going to give this to kyle mccord i go back and forth with the transfer portal and what it means and do i like it do i not like it you know it's fascinating to watch a team rebuild itself every offseason syracuse certainly needed the additions many of which names we brought up here in the portal But to me, for Syracuse to tap the Ohio State quarterback on the shoulder and convince him to come to Syracuse. Now, mind you, Kyle McCord did not have a role at Ohio State. Like, they came to an agreement, like, this relationship isn't working anymore. But the whole process of convincing a quarterback who had options to come to Syracuse, what he means, the instant, out-of-the-box franchise quarterback that is here, Chris noted it, There is a huge level up when you watch Kyle McCord throw the football, go through the practice motions, what quarterbacks do. It it is a little scary if, God forbid, something happens. And look, we've seen backup quarterbacks have to play a role and guys that aren't quarterbacks have to play quarterback, as we saw at the end of last year. I mean, Dan Valori was before, right? But, you know, the Quinn Allen and the Wildcat and the hodgepodge they put together at the end of last year. There is so much riding on McCord, and he just he looks the part. He is the part. He is just the out of the box franchise quarterback, and I don't think it can get more exciting than that when you have a player like that coming in and just what it's going to mean for this offense. He's like if you had if you had like a Ken doll for that that was a football player. Like that's, that's just like Kyle McCord, um, straight out of the box. Like you said, like he comes with all the tools you would want. He's a good leader. He can throw the ball. He's all of these things. Hundred percent. All right, guys. A couple of closing thoughts here with the spring game approaching on Saturday. Chris, I'm going to turn to you here because a lot of people have been wondering what the crowd's going to look like. It is free to get in now. A programming reminder: if you're going to the lacrosse game at two o'clock, the Syracuse Virginia lacrosse game, you still need a ticket to get into the spring game, right? So make sure you just—they're free to get. Cues.com/slash/tickets. Download it. It's on your phone. You're all set. But a, a ticket to the lacrosse game does not automatically give you admission to the spring football games. Keep that in mind. Chris, you talked to Tory Ball this week about a number of issues at the Dome, seating and everything, and he told you that uh, there, there's a, a number we can kind of peg in mind here that's going to be at the Dome for the spring game. And it turns out just by that number alone, we could be looking at, I think, uh, a record crowd for the spring game. Yeah, they've got 10,000 tickets claimed. Um, and the, the biggest crowd, at least according to uh, our uh, records, uh, is you know six thousand plus came out for Greg Robinson's first spring game at Syracuse, and that's the record. So, you know, if sixty percent of that ten thousand decides <laughs> to show up on Saturday, we've got a new spring game attendance record. So, you know, that that's pretty cool, and certainly speaks to sort of the excitement that, that's going around right now. Um, you know, they're they're going to have. They're going to be selling tickets there. They're going to have people in Club 44 to answer questions for folks that have uh, sort of reseating seat selection questions um, if you want to go there in person. So, Emily, we've heard from Coach Brown first half, one-on-ones, 
It's a game. Physical. He has stressed a couple of times. Be there. Watch that first half. Second half, we're going to see a running clock and maybe more of the twos and some things uh, mixing in here. So we've we've said some of the names. We've been building towards this. It looks like we're going to see some real football. What are some questions you hope to have answered by what we see at the spring game on Saturday? That's a good one. You know, I mean, the, the big one, right, is like just – who is the number two quarterback? Yeah. Like, do they actually have that shaken out? I think here, I think here's where I've landed. If they play both Carlos Del Rio Wilson and Braden Davis in the two position, like interchange them, I think there is a higher likelihood we would see them bring in an additional QB from outside. If only one of them plays, and it seems like one of them has a foot leg up on the other, then I think they'll just roll with whoever that is. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to see how that shakes out again. Like might be a a little hard to tell just depending on how they run the twos and the threes in that second half. But I think that's probably the big question. Um, And then just, I think I'm curious just to see some of these, some of these matchups and and different things and seeing these guys actually, actually hitting each other because we haven't seen honestly too much of that in (laughs) spring spring practice and so getting to see some of these matchups you know Yazid Haynes against the cornerback and safety groups and stuff like that down at the the lines getting to check those out um and uh, also just how these offenses and defenses operate like we've heard there's a lot of like terms that have been thrown around and like, we're, we're like, Oh yeah. The offense is pro style and everyone's learning to block and the defense, like it's physical all the time. We're going to be hunters. We're going to go get the quarterback every play, but like, what does that look like? And like, what, what are a little bit more of the schematics? Uh, we should finally get to see that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. I think the receiver group is pretty interesting too. You know, uh, like, you know, Dan was such a huge part of what they did last year, but it's also was a much different role than he's going to have on this year's team. You know, like, right. like he caught a lot of balls behind the line of scrimmage um, because like they did not have anything else to do. Um, so I am looking forward to seeing how they use him down the field, how he looks running those routes. Cause that wasn't like a strength of his last year. Um, and boy, what a dimension, you know, they'd have <laughs> if it had turned into one. Guys, great job out throughout spring practice. We will all be there Saturday at the spring game. Full coverage to come on Syracuse.com. As I mentioned, Emily and I are going to do a live pod after the spring game as well from the JMA Wireless Dome. So more to come, and certainly uh, the portal is open until the end of the month. You think spring's over when spring practice is over? I don't think so, kids. There's going to be plenty of football coverage to come. So make sure you're following here. Make sure you're following on Syracuse.com. And, of course, make sure you're following as a Syracuse Sports Insider. Just text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895. Sign up today to get direct text message access to me. Send me your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your opinions, things you want us to continue to look out for into what is no longer an off season. There's just so much going on beyond practice itself but the spring game will give us a lot of answers and we would love to hear from you guys on the text line if you're at the spring game what you're seeing as well and afterwards and sign up today it's just $3.99 a month you can try it free for two weeks and become a Syracuse Sports Insider today for now for Chris Carlson for Emily Liker I'm Brent Dax this has been another edition of Syracuse Sports we'll talk to you from the Dome on Saturday guys